and twice I went through gunnery programs with the one that had two, okay. two guns and an A1 sight and right. a bomb shack. Yeah. But I don't have a T-33. But uh, my first, I guess you may saw, call it the first real fighter was uh -huh. uh, the F-86 and I flew at Nellis. Right. Um, flew the E's and the F's, which are both day fighter models. Okay. And then I was fortunate, I was high enough in my class, none of our class of 15 um, got fighter assignments. So uh -huh. I sent us all the basic schools to right. teach students, and right. I chose, I was high enough to where I chose Willie, which Williams Air Force Base, uh -huh. which was the premier uh, training base at the time. I see. Uh -huh. And... Uh, Again, I was fortunate because about a year after that, they decided to, they moved the entire F-86 training program mm -hmm. from Nellistown to Willie, mm -hmm. Williams, and yes, uh, kept, um, well, they actually started training in F-100, so I got to instruct and uh, for about a year, year and a half, something like that. Uh huh in the F-86. I see. And uh, at Williams. And then I got an assignment over to uh, Germany to a fighter day uh, squadron. It was air superiority, they called it fighter day at the time. It was right. Day fighters. And the F-100C. Mm -hmm. And boy, I'll tell you, the C model was a real challenging airplane. It uh, had a high accident rate. Oh, one of the reasons which was Number of things about the airplane that were not as reliable as it should be. I understand. It's a first first generation supersonic fighter. Uh -huh. That was this F one hundred here. Uh -huh. um, actually, that's a D model, and I flew the C. Right. The basic difference between the two, the C model did not have any flaps. Oh, okay. Had inboard ailerons, uh -huh. whereas the D model had conventional flaps and ailerons outboard. Yeah. And uh, because it had any flaps, the uh, Final approach speed was much higher than most airplanes at the time. Mm -hmm. About 190, 195 knots coming out in front. Of right? right, right. And uh, we were flattered over in Germany where all the runways were only about 7,900 feet. And as we said, 7,900 feet and always wet. Uh -huh. <laughs> but uh, it was a uh, very challenging, very interesting experience. I, I loved it. Yeah. And then about halfway through my tour over there, they um, in Germany. In Germany, uh -huh. it, it was at the time they called it Landstuhl Air Base, but um, they later uh, combined it into renamed it Ramstein. Mm -hmm. and what they had, they had the headquarters on one side of the Autobahn was Ramstein, and on the other side was the the uh, flight line, the runway, and the three fighter squadrons, as I recall, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, we then we uh, they changed the mission of the 53rd as well as the whole 36th wing to uh, 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 nuclear strike mission. So uh, uh, the big the big difference was uh, instead of sitting air defense alert, we were sitting nuclear alert, and mm -hmm. you never flew when you had an atomic bomb hanging on the airplane because mm -hmm. fighters had a. Uh, Disturbing propensity for dropping off ordnance occasionally, you know. Mm -hmm. and anyone want somebody dropping a Mark 7 atomic bomb through, mm -hmm. even though it wasn't armed, but uh, yeah. through some church. But <laughs> right. right, like we did one day, uh, uh, some fuel tanks dropped off and fell through a church into a church, kind of messed it up a little bit. Oh, my goodness. But um, mm -hmm. so I got. Uh, uh, both ends of the spectrum there was, yeah. uh, we felt like it was pretty rewarding because the uh, uh, United States Air Force in Europe then had about, let's see, about, mm, I guess, at least 10 to 12 wings mm -hmm. of fighter bombers that were uh, uh, all nuclear capable. And each one of these wings had three, Generally, three squadrons, and each squadron had 
four airplanes on alert. So mm -hmm. Quite a few fighters. And we uh, were targeted on tactical targets, uh, some of which were close enough where we could fly low below the radar, mm -hmm. and some of which I, I got task for one during the Lebanon crisis, so it was basically a one-way mission. Yeah. And it was over in the far western portion of the Soviet Union, it's now Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I had been lucky enough not get shot down by MiGs, and our, uh, well, they didn't have the SA-2s at the time, but mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't have had enough fuel to get back to yeah. Germany. Yeah. So what years were you in Germany or in Europe? Oh, that was 1957, and uh, came home in 1961. But part of that okay. time I spent down at Aviano as a flight safety officer. Basically. Okay. Okay. Take me just sort of. You, know, you told me yesterday that you pretty much grew up on the A&M oh, campus. Yeah. Is that well, right? Well, uh, I have deep roots in this community. Right. Uh, for example, my mother uh, was a Wilcox, and uh, she grew up on the my grandfather's combination farm ranch. They ran cattle and also mm -hmm. grew uh, crops and uh, cotton uh, about three miles this side of uh, Tabor. Mm -hmm. And uh, my father, I'm a fifth generation Texan, even mm -hmm. as old as I am. Really? Uh, my great great grandfather came over with the DeWitt colony uh -huh. in 1826. Uh -huh. But my father uh, was basically punching cattle until he came to Annim College in 1919, graduated in 1923. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, interesting thing, uh, let me show it to you. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm quite proud of it. All right. Uh, oh, it means very little. Yeah, <laughs> uh, ROTC branch at a and &M. Yes, sir. And my father was in this air service branch, and his summer camp between junior and senior year was down at Kelly and Brooks right. Air, air uh -huh. Bay, uh, Brooks Field, uh -huh. Kelly Field. And uh, among other things, they, uh, this, is, this is he in a 90th squadron, the DICE, uh -huh. uh, which is still in existence. It was a fighter squadron, one of the oldest in the Air Force. Uh, uh, that's a um, de Havilland DH-4. Uh -huh. Anyhow, um, among other things, they put him through, the, put all the ROTC cadets through the observer course, and he graduated as a uh, qualified observer in air, air service. Well, my dad uh, decided not to uh, stay in the Air Force and uh, wanted to come back and go to vet school. Uh -huh. Or he, he wanted, he was an uh, animal husband, but he had right. a set, a high set on being a veterinarian. Uh -huh. uh, one of his classmates did stay in the Air Service, in the Air Corps, and the Air Force after that, and that was uh, General O.P. Wayland, mm -hmm. who retired as a four star general, matter of fact. Right. He was a classmate of my dad's. I see, I see. Anyway. I read about him in, uh, in Henry Deathloff's book. Uh, Aggies go to war. I mm. read about him in that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, he met my mother, and uh, my mother was a school teacher at the time, and they, had, they got married. And my dad uh, uh, went through vet school uh, under Dr. Mark Francis. Uh huh. And then Mark Francis asked him to come back and join the faculty. It was 1947. Mm -hmm. He'd been there ever since. And I was born in Bryan, and uh, after first grade, Going through first grade at Travis, uh, we moved out onto the campus. And our campus house was right across the street. It's where Jude Riley White is now, right mm -hmm. across the, uh, actually it was a gravel road and, and the fence to Kyle Field. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that was back during uh, the, uh, oh, John Kimbrough days. Right, right. From, uh, about mm, 1937, uh -huh. In 1940, they moved uh, almost all of the faculty off the campus, right. except for the commandant, the vice, uh, uh, one of the vice presidents, DM Anderson. In any case, we, my dad bought a house up in College Hills and I grew up there. I see. Graduated in 1952 
and the was in I because of my exposure in World War Two, watching all those T sixes fly around for Bryfield and mm -hmm. other military airplanes. Uh, incidentally my family went out in nineteen forty three when the citizens of Brazos County had bought enough war bonds to purchase an F a P fifty one. Mm -hmm. So brand new P fifty one A flew in demonstrated. Uh, never forgot that. But I, I wanted to be a pilot. But now you graduated from fifty two from from A and M. From A and M. Class and that was yeah. during the Korean War and the right. Air Force uh, called me to active duty. Right. And I went into flying school. Uh, it took me a, a year to get a slot in flying school. I made a basically poor judgment because of some poor advice from you know, the slick wing uh, teach, uh, captains out at the NMROTC branch. Uh, he advised me not to apply for flying school until I got in the Air Force to see whether I liked it. And of course I loved it and uh, it just took a long time to get around to it. But by the time I got out of flying school, and incidentally, I went to uh, Bartow, Florida for primary and flew T6s. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's where you started out? Wonderful airplane. Right. Well, my first duty station was uh, Palm Beach International Airport, and I was uh, a second lieutenant as in uh, what they then called air installations, now civil engineering. Mm -hmm. And uh, wonderful experience because I uh, got to see what the non-flying Air Force is all about. And uh, about maybe two-thirds through my year there, uh, the captain, who was a captain, who was the uh, adjutant of the squadron, got ripped in the 1953 rip. And uh, there's a reduction in force mm -hmm. after the uh, Korean War was over. Mm -hmm. And so they made me a second lieutenant, the adjutant, and that was a wonderful experience working with uh, the Air mm -hmm. And I, I thoroughly enjoyed that and uh, had a great respect for the contribution of airmen. Right. Since. Right. Uh, sometimes pilots are so divorced from the enlisted population. They right. Don't appreciate it. Sure. Anyway, I went through yeah. flying school, and uh, you might say with flying colors, and made was high in my class, and uh, the top half of the class they don't do this anymore. The top half of the class went to jets, the bottom half of the class went to multi engine. I see. And uh, <laughs> I chose. Uh, uh, jets and had my choice of uh, bases and I chose Brian. So uh -huh. came back here, went through basic, flew T-28 and T-33, graduated in 54. Uh -huh. And uh, again I was top, or I wasn't top, I think I was number three in the class, but uh -huh. top high enough to where I got my choice of F-86s. Uh -huh. They were very, uh, the most desirous of the assignments at the time. And I went down through, before I went to Nellis, I went through Laughlin at uh, Del Rio. They had just established a phase one gunnery course there in uh, what later they called the AT-33. It was just a T-30, dash one T-33, a couple of 50 calibers and gun sight. Went through all, qualified in all the uh, gunnery events. Mm -hmm. And uh, then went out to Nellis and flew 86 E's and F's. The difference, the E was the one that had the slats, and the F had an uprated engine and had hard wing. Mm -hmm. That was a result of the Korean War experience, mm -hmm. where the uh, E's with the slats would get up high altitude trying to chase the MiGs, and they'd get slow, and the slats would come out and kill or mock, and they'd stall out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they put a hard wing on it. And they got it to where the F would go up oh, close to 50,000 feet. Took a while to get up yeah. there. But uh, the MiGs would go a little, still go a little higher. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, even when I was flying, it was, uh, it was the finest uh, fighter in the world. Yeah. Uh, certainly superior to MiG 15. Right. And then uh, after instructing at Williams, uh, which was a real treat. Uh, I got this beautiful assignment to Germany, mm -hmm. and 
Potter Day Squadron, right. 53rd. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh, really, really like that. Uh, I, I have this kind of a fighter pilot personality where I like to test my ability against the uh, the odds. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, anyway, <laughs> uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Came back to the States to Air Training Command <clears throat> to Moody Air Force Base and I got into a uh, what they call uh, MAP, Pilot Training Center, Military Assistance Pack. We trained military all assistance. military assistance pack, uh, pack? Okay. all our students were uh -huh. uh, funded by a military assistance pack. In other words, they were all mostly all foreigners. We did put some Americans through that were going to go to helicopter school. Mm -hmm. We trained uh, students from 26 nations, but the predominantly, and this was started back not in the squadron in '61. Predominantly, they were Vietnamese. Not trained. Oh. Uh, over, over 100 Vietnamese students, mm -hmm. and uh, I had a, even though we were flying the T-28, which wasn't a jet, right. uh, I had a, a great sense of accomplishment. Nobody else, in those days, nobody knew, knew anything about Vietnam, right. and we hadn't even sent the advisors on it. And uh, I, uh, matter of fact, I went down and volunteered to go to uh, Eglin to be in that jungle gym program, which was the call sign for the uh, air commanders, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, found that I couldn't do that because my status was frozen because they had selected me for for a uh, uh, inner service school, Armed Forces Staff College. Mm -hmm. So I was in that squadron until about '67. Went to Norfolk to Armed Forces Staff College. Volunteered for Vietnam. Gave me my choice between the F-4 and the 105, and uh, I, wrote, I wanted to go chase MiG, so I chose the F-4. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, um, powers that be and personnel sent me in country rather than to Yuban mm -hmm. or Yundorn over in Thailand. Mm -hmm. They were the ones that chased MiGs, and I was at Cameron Bay, oh, okay. which uh, uh, it, uh, I enjoyed that too. Were you still flying? I was flying the F4? A F4, uh -huh. F4C. That the uh, that out was the out first of model. Cameron Bay. Cameron Bay. Okay. 559th Attack Fighter Squadron. Uh -huh. And uh, that was the first model that the Air Force uh, built. Uh, of course, the F4 was a Navy airplane. Right. And uh, uh, the Air Force thought enough, or McNamara thought enough of it the way he forced it down the throat of the Air Force. And the Air Force didn't like that, but they actually found out they had a pretty good airplane. Running. So this was called the Phantom II? The Phantom II. Okay. F4 and is the Phantom. Yes. Phantom yes. And uh, so I, I threw about, oh, two-thirds, three-fourths of a tour at Cameron Bay, and then uh, my squadron commander called me in and uh, told me they needed a silver-tongued individual to go down to Tom Sanuk to be briefing officer for General Brown, the commanding general. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, do I have a choice? And he said, no. And I said, okay, sir, I'll All go. Right. <laughs> All right. That was, uh, it, it, uh, uh, that was a, a good assignment. I, uh, John Brown didn't like to get briefed on Sunday. Mm -hmm. So I had 24 hours after Saturday briefing until I had to start the, another briefing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would go over to... Uh, Go to any squadron I, I could find that had an open seat to fly. Mm -hmm. And at Benoit was a fighter base about, I guess, 20, 25 kilometers, 15 miles or so from, from uh, Saigon. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of these friends I had in the, in the VNAF, the Vietnamese Air Force, there were probably two dozen or, a dozen or two. Of, now, must have been about a dozen people in that squadron that I knew, from the squadron commander to the flight commanders and others. And the and people that you had trained, fly right? the F-5. People that you had trained? The, yes. From the Vietnamese Air Force, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh -huh. And they let me fly the uh, F-5. And I flew about 19 combat sorties with them. Yeah. And um, also, from nostalgia, I... Uh, 
with down through the back seat and and oh half a dozen sorties in the F one hundred F because I'd flown the one hundred and uh, heck I'd go fly with anybody anywhere that had a had an open cockpit. I even uh, I even flew with a uh, a spooky crew one night the uh, AC forty seven. Uh huh. It's, it's called a spooky. Spooky crew. Well, that was the call sign. Spooky. Yeah. It it was a gunship. Uh huh. The C forty seven that had three mini guns. Uh huh. Uh, pointing out the side on the left hand side. Right. And the pilot had a sight uh, next to him, and he could aim the guns by maneuvering the yeah. C forty seven. Yeah. It was the first of uh, several models of gunships. They, then uh -huh. they had a C one A C one nineteen and A C one thirty. Yeah. And it is the A C one thirties are still current in the Air Force. Right. And in special forces at Herbert. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed my combat tour over in Vietnam. Tell me more about it. Tell me about uh, you, you were you were a fighter pilot. You, yes. Your job every day was. And to... uh, um, I'd fly on average every two out of every three days, mm -hmm. simply because we had uh, probably had more airplanes and fewer sorties than we had pilots and squadron, and so didn't get didn't get to fly every day. Mm -hmm. uh, it was. Uh, a seven day week, uh, except for the uh, uh, R and R, and most of us got a mini R and R. No, well, there's two weeks out of out of country with for the with the year, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, actually, I had been a flying safety officer down at Aviano. After, uh, in Germany, flying 100s and T-33, mm -hmm. and uh, so I had a good appreciation of accident rates. And so when I got to Cameron Bay, I got coming through some of their uh, the loss rates to combat, the loss rates to operational accidents, and I figured I was uh, in no more jeopardy than when I was flying F-100s. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> But that 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 wasn't a concern of mine. I, I I've always been fearless, and it's never never bothered me. Um, a lot of people say you know I'm always scared in combat, but anyway, um, it uh, one thing if we get a chance to mention it. Okay. I would kind of like to mention uh, in Memorial, mm -hmm. my backseater that I trained with, and Davis Monthan, and he was my backseater, and uh, Cameron Bay mm -hmm. didn't make it back. Mm -hmm. he what was and, his name? Uh, Tom Burge. Tom Burge? A fine young man. Mm -hmm. And um, he uh, was flying with, uh, uh, this was not too long after I left. Cameron Bay to go to uh, Tonsonu, and I had been the flight commander, and my assistant flight commander then moved up, took over my job as flight commander, and since Tom Burge was the best gib or guy in the back mm -hmm. back seater in the flight, he took over my gib, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they were they were killed on a, a night uh, scramble. Um, as an aside, uh, a couple of people asked me what, what was the most terrifying event I had blind fighters or, or actually. Yeah, I was about to ask that. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, <laughs> curiously enough, my most terrifying event was not in combat. It was flying the F4. Mm -hmm. But I, uh, for about mm, four weeks, five weeks, something like that, I went up to. Uh, Tegu, Korea, one of the squadrons in the 12th uh, wing, uh, their camera had, had been deployed up there as air defense for uh, after the North Koreans hijacked the Pueblo. Mm -hmm. you recall that? Right, sure. We were at Tegu, 
and uh, we set alert with uh, F-4Cs, and we had uh, four Sparrow missiles, four Sidewinder missiles, and a gun pod. And the gun pod was a big, long, 1,100-pound pod that had the, the Gatling gun and 1,100 rounds of mm -hmm. ammunition. And we had some interesting uh, scrambles. I had two scrambles in one day. Both both we went out and scrambled. Uh, or we uh, intercepted a Russian Badger uh, in, Intel aircraft or mm -hmm. uh, intelligence gathering aircraft. Mm -hmm. ELIT is what they call it. But back to my uh, most terrifying mission. Uh, uh, one night we were on alert at about 3 a.m. They scrambled us. And I did not wake up. I was not conscious of anything until I was passing through 5,000 feet. Wow. I do not remember the klaxon going off. I do not remember running out to the airplane, getting in, me starting the airplane, the backseater making the radio calls and doing his thing, taxiing out. And I was a flight leader and I was the led the, the other flight. And I was just in an alpha state. It's just like highway hypnosis. Mm -hmm. I was doing everything by rote. <laughs> Fortunately, I did everything right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but that, when I woke up and considered that, that would terrify me. Sure. Were you sleep deprived? Was that it? I mean, were you Well, just no, hurt? no, no. Um, I wasn't sleep deprived. Yeah. I always got adequate sleep. Yeah. It's just that when you wake up or, or alert out of a dead sleep at uh -huh. 3 a.m., right. it's... Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And I had been scrambled the night before and uh -huh. not had that. I'd, I'd been awake. Right. That one, that, that one kind of got to me. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. What about terrifying, actually, combat events? I mean. No. Uh, in South Vietnam, we, uh, we would go up to Quezon there with the Quezon battle was going on. Mm -hmm. And they were shooting at us. But. Uh, in South Vietnam, they had so little, uh, the NVA and the uh, VC had so little armament of any, uh, anything good that uh, mm -hmm. uh, it was a big deal when the Ford Air Controller found a 50 caliber shooting. Mm -hmm. And he would call in all the tack air he could get and wipe out that little 50 caliber machine guns. Right, right. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I guess uh, I got, uh, I guess one of my, one of my memorable missions in, uh, in Vietnam uh, was when the Quezon battle was uh, going on. It wasn't the height of the Quezon battle, it was toward the end there, it was after Tet hit. Mm -hmm. I think this was in April mm -hmm. of 68. And they called us all in for briefing, and they said, well, we're going to go up and carry maximum load to Quezon. And uh, normally we carried uh, about uh, six 750-pound bombs, three on each uh, intermediate station on the wing, mm -hmm. and about uh, a couple of fuel tanks. And in this case, we had uh, six uh, bombs on what you call the MIR. That was a multiple eject, uh, no, tur, tri triple ejection racks. It carried mm -hmm. three 750-pound bombs under each wing. And they had a MIR, or a multiple ejector rack, underneath the, uh, underneath the center mm -hmm. of the fuselage, and it would carry three and three, or six. So it was 12 750-pound bombs. So they came in for a briefing and said, well, guys, uh, uh, we're going to carry 12 750-pound bombs. The only problem is it uh, makes the center of gravity a little bit too far forward, mm -hmm. and the airplane won't take off normally. And uh, he said, see, because a, a little quirk in the F-4 is unlike any other airplane I ever flew. Mm -hmm. Maybe there are other airplanes that do the same thing, but uh, except for that mission, every 
takeoff I ever made in the F4, you start the takeoff row of the stick right back as far as it'll go, right back, mm -hmm. uh, against the seat. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the power in both engine and afterburner, when the airplane gets to nose liftoff, <laughs> nose comes up, this flies off beautifully as yeah. can. And uh, in this case, it said, well, uh, nose wheel won't lift off. It says, here's what you have to do. Uh, leave the stick in neutral, and that will mean that the horizontal stabilizer, in, in, instead of being up like this, mm -hmm. would be neutral, and therefore less drag. And so when you get up to, a, I believe, I think it was 153 knots, take the stick and bang it against the instrument panel and right back in the gut and leave it there. And so that will depress the nose gear strut and then the uh, reaction will put it back up to the right angle of attack and it'll take off. All of us uh, thought to ourselves, <laughs> yes sir, if you say so, Colonel, we'll do it. You mean dip down and then go up? Huh? <laughs> and uh, if I got it, it worked. And every airplane got off. So just a level. little bounce. And uh, we, uh, it was such a heavy load that we had to go on a tanker. And in case I was so far away, uh -huh. we had to go on a tanker and uh, refuel. And we got up to case I. And the reason for this semi panic was that the North Vietnamese moved, moved some cannons in on the reverse slope of the mountain that's just to the northeast, about uh, six or eight miles or so, mm -hmm. from the airstrip, the Marine airstrip, Marine base. And uh, not only were they shooting up over um, at, at the at Khe Sanh base, but they were also shooting at airplanes in the sky. Mm -hmm. And it was so smoky and explosions down there, the target tell. And uh, they put us in a holding pattern. We were a fifth up, stacked up in a holding pattern, waiting for the fact that everybody else to drop their armament and we'd get down. And, and they had told us that, uh, and the fact told us also, he said, uh, uh, guys are shooting at you down there. And so uh, ripple off your entire load in one pass, mm -hmm. meaning put it on a ripple, which would have a, a, a slight sequence between each bomb, so mm -hmm. it would heat it, hit each other going down, right. and and it dropped 12 of these 750 pound bombs wow. and <laughs> pulled out, and uh, then we were a little skosh on fuel getting back, and uh, we took advantage, we didn't take advantage, we used the facility the Navy, uh, the Marines had at Chulai. Mm -hmm. Uh, and Chu Lai had a conventional runway. And it had originally started out as a SAS base. It's a marine experiment they had. Mm -hmm. It was a great idea. They had an arresting gear to stop the airplane, and then they had a catapult that would catapult them all. Mm -hmm. They had a very short runway. But uh, as the war progressed, they went in there, uh, round route, went in there and made a concrete runway. But the neat thing about it is, Marines would let us hot refuel. We and they did their own airplanes. So we move into the refueling pit, shut down the left engine, and they would uh, put mm -hmm. their uh, single point refueling right. on and refuel the airplane. As soon as it refueled, we'd start the engine in, just go right out, yeah. take off, and go back to Cameron Bay. Yeah. And the Air Force uh, was pretty s stuffy about it. You landed at Da Nang, the mm -hmm. Air Force base. And it'd make you shut down, and everybody had to go in operation. You had to file another flight plan, and all yeah. this. And it took a lot more time. Right. So it's pretty Yeah, we, uh, we like Marines. Yeah, I'll I've bet. always liked Marines. Right. I, I like them. <laughs> anyway, um, we uh, and then had several night missions that were exciting. Yeah. <laughs> I was on a on a dive bomb run, and just about to pick a off and. The flare went out. Oh, <laughs> it was dark, and so I figured I had a pretty good solution. I just pickled off the bomb and pulled out. And by the time another flare came out, but it was uh, it was interesting. And we had some troops in contact missions that were very, I thought, very rewarding. Uh -huh. And 
whatever would go out on the ore pad on on those, we would normally be loaded with loaded with uh, what. I guess this is a this is a marine or a navy uh, terminology, and we picked it up too. We called it snake and nape. Mm -hmm. Snake was what they called high drag bombs, and we'd have 750 pound bombs, and uh, you would release them at low altitude, uh, and if you didn't have this retarding device, they'd blow up and blow your airplane out of the air, mm -hmm. and these uh, steel just like an umbrella would pop open and uh, retard the bomb enough so you had clearance before the bomb hit the ground. Slow down the bomb. Yeah. Uh, and uh, nape was, of course, napalm. And we loved dropping napalm because mm -hmm. that was so effective, you know, particularly in troops and contacts. Right. Troops. And then one of the airplanes would have CBUs, which are uh, cluster bomb units. Have you ever seen or heard of cluster bomb units? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let me yeah. show you one. I've okay. Got, I've got a dessert cluster bomb unit. Yeah. This is blue. That means it's inert. But right. this is what they look like. Okay. And they're aluminum and they have uh, steel uh, pellets embedded in there. Right. And the charge. And those fins rotate it after it goes out of the tube uh -huh. and you drop it and then it uh, arms itself after it rotates so many times like right. a, like a real bomb. Right. Wow. That could cause some damage. <laughs> yeah. It's like hand grenades, a whole bunch of them. Right. Another mission that involved these that I went on uh, at Cameron Bay, the armament center for Meglin brought some uh, what they call fuel air munitions, mm -hmm. um, commonly called propane bombs. Right. These darn things are really strange looking. They look like a regular uh, propane tank, about this big around, about 15 feet long, and they just had a conical uh, steel uh, nose welded on. In the back, they did have some. Uh, uh, fins. And somewhere back there they would put a uh, offer grenade mm -hmm. uh, fuse to the proper interval that they wanted. Well, uh, they wanted to try these out. And uh, somebody came up with the concept, well I thought it was a pretty sound concept. Um, up near Kuchi, which is so hmm, roughly north of uh, Saigon, mm -hmm. uh, the VC had a Tremendous underground complex, mm -hmm. tunnels, spider holes, and everything. So the theory was, I went out with the initial flight uh, about 30 minutes before the fuel and air munitions, and we dropped CBUs, dropped these, mm -hmm. and uh, some of them were instantaneous, and some of them were fused to cook off within a half hour, 45. Mm -hmm. And uh, presumably this would cause the uh, uh, BC and NVA, whoever was in there, both of them, mm -hmm. to go underground. Mm -hmm. And then they came along with fuel air munition and dropped, and this propane would seep down into the tunnels and then go off. And they showed us some movies, and it was really impressive. They go whoop. It didn't sound like an explosion, just a mm -hmm. And uh, they told us that uh, the overpressure was the greatest, uh, was greater than any weapon we had in our inventory except nuclear weapons. Wow. Now, I didn't have well, anywhere near as much as, uh, overpressure as nuclear weapons, but uh, certainly more than anything else. Mm -hmm. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, we wanted some feedback on it after we after they went out and dropped those, and uh, uh, the army declined to go down to the tunnels and find out. Yeah, I uh, yeah. Uh, I think they still have some fuel air munitions in the inventories. So right. One time. Right. In fact, I was uh, see a couple of weeks ago. I was uh, there at Gaglin 
Irma Museum. And, uh, uh -huh. Took some pictures of, of them. And, uh, was talking, I was trying to talk to the curator, but he was briefing some group of kids that I had yeah. always been interested in. Right. Uh, as a matter of fact, I've always been interested in, in uh, the Arma that we dropped off of it. So sure. Yeah. Another thing uh, yeah. I might, I forgot to talk about mm -hmm. now. Um, um, I flew all these fighters, and curious enough, my favorite by far is that F-86 Sabre. Mm -hmm. That was such a beautiful airplane to fly, and such an easy airplane to fly that the controls were so highly balanced that you could fly that with a stick. Mm -hmm. with just two fingers. Right. And, uh, and it's easy to, easy to fly formation with. And, had a few emergencies, uh, problems. Had a uh, in-flight fire, which uh, sounds worse than it was. Uh, it was an electrical fire, electrical wire. It basically filled up the cockpit with uh, this acrid smoke uh, uh, from wires, mm -hmm. insulation burning off. So I just went by the tech checklist, turned off all of the electrical. And uh, it uh, cut off the source of the fire. F-86 has a canopy that slides back on rails. Right. And so cockpit was full of smoke. I just opened the canopy, <laughs> got all the smoke out of there, and I was within sight of Williams Air Force Base anyway. I just yeah. came down. And, uh, so you were, you were flying fairly low at the time? So. Oh, I, I, no, I was returning from a I see. And I just uh, came down. And, yeah. Um, had a wingman who figured out what was going on. Stu, uh, and uh, he figured what was going on. We got our initial, and I rocked my wings, which is the signal for no radio. Right. And, uh, it, there was no problem. I had a lot of emergency. I'm pretty sure it's emergency. I figured I'd save a couple airplanes for airports, but in the 100. But. Uh, the point I was going to make, I got to the F-4, uh -huh. and I have flown almost a thousand hours in, in most of the models of the F-4, the 4C and the D and the E. I have never, never had a single emergency in that airplane. It's so reliable. And uh, I, from what I have read, the F-16, the F-15, and the F-22 are also uh, even more reliable than the Mm -hmm. And uh, the accident rate, which I mentioned was probably 30, 35 accidents per 100,000 flying hours in the F-100. Mm -hmm. Accident rate for fighters is now down around maybe one and a half or two accidents per 100,000 flying hours. Wow. The improvement is remarkable yeah. because the engines are more reliable in the airframe and systems are more reliable. Right. You don't get lost as often. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, after Vietnam, um, I went over to back over to Europe. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I got to take my family over there both times. Mm -hmm. uh, went to Ramstein to 17th Air Force Headquarters, and where I was initially Chief of Flight Safety, mm -hmm. and um, then Director of Safety for 17th, until um, they shot the headquarters back. And we're going to move 17th Air Force over to Simbach Air Base, which is about 15 kilometers away and mm -hmm. um, 10 miles away. And uh, I, uh, another guy had come in that outranked me, took over the job as director of safety. Mm -hmm. I went out to Spang Dalem, and we started up a new wing there, 52nd TIE Fighter Wing, which is still in existence over there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I established a safety program for the wing and um, this was in, in Germany in Germany yeah. and I had while I was at Ramstein I'd been flying the F-4E mm -hmm. and uh, then in the uh, 52nd wing I was flying the F-4D mm -hmm. and uh, I was so fortunate uh, from the day I got into flying school until maybe a month uh, not today a couple of days after I got to Bartow uh, until about a month before uh, 
that's before I retired. Um, I was actively flying. Mm -hmm. And I went to a couple of service schools, uh, Air Force uh, uh, Squadron Officer School, but we were all assigned to an airplane. Of course, <laughs> the most careful the airplane I was assigned to, I was flying the C-45, a little twin-engine beach. Mm -hmm. And in Armed Forces Staff College, uh, I wasn't, wasn't no, I wasn't allowed to fly, I just wasn't assigned anywhere to fly. Mm -hmm. But my uh, seminar leader had a deal worked out where he got his proficiency time with the Navy and Navy T-28s. Mm -hmm. And I'd flown a lot of time with T-28s, but I had flown some Navy T-28s. And uh, we'd go over there about every week and a half for a couple of weeks and fly Navy airplanes. Mm -hmm. And that was fun too. Yeah. Uh, but I... Uh, when did you retire? I retired in 1973. Mm -hmm. And... Um, where were you still in Europe? Or well, or? I was at Spangdahl. And the Air Force came out with a policy uh, right there in the last little bit uh, that, uh, quote, unquote, I uh, didn't have to fly anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, I could draw flying pay, but I didn't have to fly proficiency. Mm -hmm. And uh, everybody had been flying for 20 years. And I went to my wing commander. I was the wing director of safety, and I was supposed to fly the mission airplane. I was flying the F-4D. And he said, oh, no, you got a major work for it. He's flying the F-4D. You don't need to fly it. So I had about made the decision anyway, but I, that, that sealed the decision for me to retire when I got back to the the port at uh, McGuire. Mm -hmm. um, I just, frankly, um, my sole motivation in the Air Force was flying. And uh, I didn't fly fighters the entire time. I was in training for a while, but um, that was my motivation. Mm -hmm. And I just could not see going back and sitting at some desk doing something, whatever, right. and watching other people fly. Yeah. So I, I retired. With a total of 21 years, 20 of them flying, mm -hmm. and uh, logged uh, close to, but not quite, 5,000 hours in Air Force flying time, mm -hmm. which uh, loved every minute of it. Sure. sure. And I came back to uh, A&M, mm -hmm. and uh, I had uh, earned, studied for, and earned a master's degree in systems management from the University of Southern California while I was in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, got a job with the Executive Development Programs Office at A&M and College of Business. Mm -hmm. Taught management a little bit. They were uh, uh, they were desperate for people to teach management. And mm -hmm. I was qualified to do so. And uh, uh, Maybe we might have not mentioned this, but after mm -hmm. about eight years, I got fed up to here with what I consider to be office politics. Mm -hmm. I now look back and realize what that was, was the encroaching political correctness, but nobody had named it by that, mm -hmm. at that time. And I had a, some other disagreement with uh, the dean of the College of Business, a new dean had come in, and he was trained changing a lot of the aspects of the executive uh, development program, so I uh, uh, I resigned, but I was able to retire when mm -hmm. I reached a couple of years, a couple, three years later when I reached mm -hmm. 55 years old, mm -hmm. and uh, <coughs> worked about 30 years for E.F. Hutton, which was great. I uh, mm -hmm. learned a lot about investing, mm -hmm. and my wife and I have always been savers and investors, and right. uh, we... Uh, uh, with the retired pay and what we've invested, we're, yeah. we're not hurting. Yeah, good. good. And uh, we're not rich, but we're not hurting. <laughs> Tell me about your, your, your family, when and you and, and uh, Ann, is that right? Ann when and you, I you, uh, met uh, in Stephen F. Austin High School in Bryan. Uh -huh. uh, a good many of the professors at a and uh, I went consolidated up through freshmen and, and consolidated. Uh -huh. And we had just about as many people 
in the entire consolidated high school as they had in, in one uh, in the class of 48 of Brian Stephen F. Austin. Mm -hmm. Perhaps a few more, but about the same. And um, uh, Stephen F. Austin had a, a much greater reputation mm -hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so most, uh, a lot of professors, uh, other people at the college station, sit kids in Brian. So I went in uh, sophomore in high school, and Ann and I met and started going together. And, mm -hmm. and then she went, <laughs> her parents sent up for a TC, TSCW and told her to stay up there until she got, got, got a degree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that wasn't exactly true. Uh, well, she got a degree. They didn't want us to get married. Yeah, they didn't want us to get married. <laughs> they didn't want anything in between. <laughs> anyway, we, uh, she graduated in three and a half years from TSCW and came back. And they allowed us to uh, to get married about six weeks before I graduated in 1952. Uh -huh. And uh, then... Uh, when I graduated, I just sat around for about three year, three months, up for three months, waiting to go into the Air Force. And, so you got married right before you graduated from mm -hmm. from A and M. I think <coughs> we. Uh, uh -huh. He wasn't uh, old enough. He wasn't twenty one when he graduated from A and M. I see. They couldn't take him into the program. I see. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I had to be twenty one, and I yeah. I graduated at uh, twenty. Uh huh. Um, you're probably familiar with this, but. Uh, it wasn't until about 1940, uh, no, a little later than that, that uh, Texas went to a 12-year school system. Mm -hmm. And I got in early enough, right. so Ann and I graduated with 11 years. Mm -hmm. I uh, skipped the fifth grade, mm -hmm. and that was great, because everybody said fifth grade is really hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, anyway, we... Uh, We've been together a long time. Yeah. So you have family? And yeah, had two boys. Uh -huh. uh, our oldest um, was uh, in a uh, the electronics design program at the Engineering Extension uh, Service mm -hmm. used to run out at the annex. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know whether you're familiar with it or not, but mm -hmm. uh, this program uh, predated. PCs, and a lot of these graduates went to work yeah. designing circuits for right. computers. Right. Well, Glenn, uh, he's right, right ready to graduate, and mm -hmm. uh, was killed in a head-on collision. Oh my goodness! Coming back from the right there at the entrance to Brian Field. Back and next, right there. On and our youngest son. Um, At the time, wanted to uh, take foreign affairs or something like that, and uh, he told me that uh, they had good programs at TU and Cougar High, and mm -hmm. USC, and Tulane. <laughs> and I told him, I said, well, Fred, you can't afford to go to TU or Cougar High. He knew what I was talking about. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I said, I got a master's degree from USC. You go out there if you want. He chose Tulane. Mm -hmm. And then he went through uh, uh, all school. I see. And he has been at the University of Texas. Okay. <coughs> well, I don't. Well, if he'd have gone through <laughs> Tulane Law School, he would have been practicing Napoleonic yeah, Law. Napoleonic I was law. not going to have any Napoleonic <laughs> Law. I like Spanish Law much better. Well, I, I must agree. If you're going to be a lawyer at Texas, you need to go through the TU Law School. Yeah. <laughs> He's been a. Um, uh, assistant district attorney in Dallas now for about 18, 19 years. Okay. And, uh, What's his name? Fred. Fred, Fred, Fred Burns. Burns. Uh-huh. Um, Do they have any kids? No. Okay. Um, his wife is a feminist. I see. She is a product, she is a tea sipper. I see. Her father's on the faculty. I see. I see. I mean, tea sipper yeah. with a capital T <laughs> and a bright orange. <laughs> <laughs> But her brother and her sister-in-law are Aggies. I see. Okay. Well, good. <laughs> so he's a, he's a, a assistant DA in Dallas. Yeah, he's been okay. Criminal prosecutor. I see. He ran for judge, but didn't make it this way. So. I see. I think uh, the district attorney, the the new district attorney that selected uh, last election, 
uh, is a good friend of his. Uh -huh. and, uh, I suspect that when a court becomes available, he'll get a point or two. He's I already think. been vetted for judge. Right. So he's he's next in, or should be next in line. For and he's a, he's a Republican, so yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so good shot. He got beaten out uh, for the judge by a uh, uh, black uh, female. I see. Anyway, um, we were very proud of him. One other thing uh, that I didn't mention along the way because it didn't involve flying. Uh -huh. uh, oh, back there in the late 50s, late 60s, I'd have to go out to the uh, range every year and requalify with a 45 because I was a combat fire pilot. Uh -huh. It hurt my pride that I had trouble qualifying with a 45. Uh -huh. I got a, a gun collection of cold automatics there. Right. But I just had trouble shooting a 45. And about 1963, uh, we'd moved the squadron from Moody over to Randolph, and I had a guy in the uh, squadron who was on the Randolph pistol team. Uh -huh. I was telling him my tail of woe, and he says, oh, I, I teach you how to shoot 45 in two hours. Right. Like, hey, that's going to be a trick. I'm going to let you do that. Uh -huh. And uh, he used a, uh, uh, a very well accurized uh, com uh, competition mm -hmm. 45. Mm -hmm. And instead of using that hardball 230 grain bullet 45 on ammunition, uh, used 180 grain behind about a half a load it was for uh, competition shoot. Uh -huh. And uh, he um, apparently recognized that I had talent, uh -huh. raw talent, and I always liked to shoot pistols. Right. But I never did any competition. Yeah. And so uh, he asked me to join the pistol team. And I was on a couple of different Air Force pistol teams until I went to Vietnam and then didn't shoot any over there. Right. Except uh, 20 millimeter. Uh -huh. And um, then subsequently to Europe, I didn't shoot anymore. When I got back, I was kind of over the hill as a competitor, but I pretty well knew my trade. Uh -huh. I knew how to shoot well. Uh -huh. And uh, so I voluntarily went over to uh, Trigon to volunteer my services as an assistant coach for the pistol team. Found out they had allowed it to lapse. Uh -huh. They didn't have one. Mm -hmm. So uh, I uh, I formed one. Uh, I got the uh, cooperation of a, an army captain at Dulles. Mm -hmm. We started the anti pistol team up again in 1974. I see. Been coaching it ever since. Five minutes because can't find anybody to take it over from me. Yeah. <laughs> but I love it. I tell you. And I uh, I get. Uh, I get more satisfied. I get as much satisfaction out of coaching as yeah. I get out of shooting. Yeah. How many are on the team? Oh, we've got. Uh, I basically coach two teams. Uh -huh. One is a university team, and I got about twelve people on that. I think four or five girls, uh, mm -hmm. thirteen or fourteen, something like that. And then I, I coach the ROTC pistol team, mm -hmm. and we've got about. 10 or 12 on that. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd say 10, 12. Mm -hmm. uh, it depends on who comes. <laughs> yeah. But um, two years ago, um, my ROTC pistol team that I coached, I should have called it high. I coached, mm -hmm. uh, won the uh, NRA National Collegiate Pistol ROTC Championship. I remember that. I remember that. And yeah. uh, we generated quite a lot of uh, positive recognition in uh -huh. the uh, Trigon. And so I think it's led to a situation that will perpetuate the pistol team. Right. They, uh, they, last year, uh, one of the team members used his own initiative and um, wonderful leadership and, and perseverance and negotiating skill. He persuaded the powers that be in Trigon to create the uh, ROTC pistol team as an ROTC sponsored unit, mm -hmm. uh, similar to um, the Orient.
orienteering team and the fish drill team and the RVs, they're all units. Right. And I have a commander. Right. And that's the way it is. With the ROTC consultant. Mm -hmm. Last year, came in second again, but uh, uh -huh. we had come in second and won it, came in second. And this year, I'm, I'm hoping we'll be able to beat out our uh, whole house. They won it again. Right. So how many times next year will be? Is there, is there just that main competition, or are there other competitions leading oh, up to the Oh, we have a number of competitions. For example, uh -huh. we're having a, uh, a big match, I say big match, moderate size match in November, mm -hmm. and our chief competitors uh, are the team from uh, uh, what's now Missouri State University. It used to be Southwest Missouri mm -hmm. State right. at uh, Springfield, Missouri. Right. And in December, we will go up there and have a match with them. I see. And then we'll have uh, a match to go to over at TU in January. Yeah. And we'll host a uh, uh, NRA sectional here in February. Right. That's the one where we post a score that we um, hope to qualify for the nationals. Mm -hmm. Now, they've had the nationals 26 years, and our team, it takes, you got to be in the top 10 teams in the nation to be invited. Mm -hmm. And we've been invited and gone 20, 24, 24 years out of 26. Yeah. Pretty successful, yeah. Well, it's typical because I don't have any scholarships. Right. I have, a, let's say, minimal support. Um, for example, we'd, we'd like to have more money for travel. Mm -hmm. But uh, we do. I have uh, <clears throat> put in a number of grants that I have received uh, mm -hmm. excellent support from the NRA Foundation to buy a state-of-the-art competition pistol. Mm -hmm. And uh, but it's it's tough uh, competing with the uh, military academies, particularly uh, Naval Academy and, and uh, West Point, mm -hmm. and to some extent also Coast Guard Academy. Mm -hmm. Air Force Academy uh, doesn't uh, they have a team, but uh, they haven't. We we have a better team. Yeah, yeah, uh, but. We have come in, uh, I believe, once in those years, third. Right. That's the best we've done. I see. In our university team. Yeah. Yeah. Is this you? Yes, it is. I like the, like the stash. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> some fighter pilots uh, do wear mustaches, and uh, um, I guess they tolerated me. They, uh, they, <laughs> Didn't really know what to do with the squadron, but the funny thing, um, he's either the chief of staff or the uh, PACAF commander. I'm not sure, but it was General John Ryan who he called him uh, Three Fingers Ryan because he got two fingers shot off in the B-17 <laughs> in World War II. Uh -huh. He was the strategic air command right. type. And he did not like mustaches. Uh -huh. So he was coming to Cameron Bay. Yeah. And my squadron commander said, Burns, you go up the tower and step the tower the entire time that Ryan's here. <laughs> and they knew darn well that General Ryan wasn't going to climb all those stairs to go up to the tower. <laughs> so they wouldn't see me. Uh, so where was this taken? Was this taken in Cameron Bay or was that? Uh, let's see. Into uh, this was during the time I was up in uh, in the 558 at uh, Tegu, uh -huh. and uh, this was uh, this was the Cameron Bay. You can see some of the bombs and the missiles over here, and I I've got a uh, survival vest on. You can't see it, but I've got a I got a 45 slung on my right hip there. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Is this a, a Phantom too? Uh, that's uh, that's a four Phantom, right? Yeah. Wow. Anyway, uh, I think I've had a wonderful experience, um, and uh, wonderful life. Yeah, fascinating. Uh, really, of, really uh, fascinating. Uh, a lot of it was very rewarding. Yeah. 
uh, not so much in monetarily or getting promoted to high rank. Uh, when you retired from the Air Force, what, what rank were you? I was a major. Major? Mm -hmm. uh, we won't need to go into this, but uh, mm -hmm. back when I was the first lieutenant, they caught me buzzing. They caught you buzzing? I got caught buzzing. Oh, okay. And they gave me an Article 15. It's supposed to be death for an officer. But, uh, and I'd rather not. <laughs> I'm not ashamed of it. I don't mind telling, but I don't want to put it on the yeah. on the air. But no, in think. any case, uh, the wing commander at the time was uh, Colonel George S. Brown. Uh -huh. Later, it was a four-star general. As a matter of fact, he was a guy I briefed in, mm -hmm. in Vietnam, and he went on to be chief of staff of the Air Force, the chief of the Joint Chiefs. And uh, but he was an old bomber. Mm -hmm. He didn't tolerate uh, fighter pilots acting like fighter pilots again. <laughs> and so, uh, standing up in front of him, getting my Article 15, he said, oh, Lieutenant says, you probably will never make captain. It kind of froze my brain. I don't remember a thing he said after that. But uh, I decided I was just going to stay on it as long as he would let me fly. Well, contrary to what he predicted, I made captain on time, uh -huh. major on time. I went to squadron officer school. Not everybody gets selected for that. Something, something's going to have to do that. Mm -hmm. I, I was pretty good at my trade. Yeah. Not the best, but pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah. Uh, we all say we're the world's greatest fighter pilot. But, uh -huh. uh, you know, um, oh, there, there are those who are better. Right. Uh, and then I went to Armed Forces Staff College, which is an intermediate uh, uh -huh. staff college. And, uh, pretty high, highly prestigious. So. Right. Right. And uh, volunteered for Vietnam and uh, just failed to make uh, Lieutenant Colonel. I think they drugged up that old. Uh, <laughs> the old buzzing? <laughs> that didn't make any difference to me because um, I pretty well knew if I got promoted to Lieutenant Colonel, my, my flying days were going to be. Yeah. yeah. And like I said, my motivation was flying. Right. So uh, it, it, that's it, what you wanted to do? What I want to do, and that's what I got to do. Well, great. Um, well, good. We're gonna we're gonna do this. Uh, we're gonna tape this show tomorrow at 1:30, over near where you used to live, over there at KAMU TV. You know where the TV station is there, off the of Houston Cross Street. Crossing the abortion clinic. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Is that is that what was there? <laughs> okay. Uh, well, no. Yeah. Uh, now wait a minute. Uh, are you talking KMU's one on campus? Right, on campus. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, not KBTS. KMUC. No, no, okay. no, 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 no. Okay, not KBTS. KMU. That's no, no, right, this KMU, yeah. because I find yeah, it on campus. Right. on Dish Network uh, right. with the oh, okay. uh, HD, uh -huh. uh, they're, they have three channels. Oh, they're right, yeah. And it's yeah. the middle one, 12-02. Uh, yeah. Right, right. Now, I right. finally found on your cable at channel four. I, yeah. I was able to tape it uh, when yeah. you had Terry Rosser on. Right, last weekend. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, KMU is right there on yeah, uh, I know where it is. Houston Street. They're right across from the former students. I know where building. it is. Matter of fact, One story when Ann and I uh, married, mm -hmm. uh, we got uh, some of the old uh, uh, veterans and married housing. Mm -hmm. They used to have housing there across the street. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I don't know. Or, or a bunch of uh, buildings that they had brought up from uh, Foster Field mm -hmm. in uh, um, Victoria when it closed down after right. the war. Right. And I remember we got a, we had an apartment in there, two bedroom apartment for $30 a month, which yeah. that was just about my uh, ROTC pay. Uh-huh. <clears throat> so. Yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah. Live right over there. Yeah. Well, that'll be uh, that'll we'll do it at uh, at one thirty. If you could be there around what would you like for me to wear? One twenty. Anything that you that you wish. I always wear a coat and tie, but my guests normally don't. So anything that you you're comfortable don't? in, yeah, okay. normally they don't. I, I was noticing Terry. I thought right. that was a neat. Yeah, he wore, that he he's the only person so far that's worn his uniform. Well, worn, uh, worn I don't uniform. have one that will fit. Right. Well, he didn't. He didn't either. He said he bought that just a couple of years ago for a yeah something uh, that his son yeah, was doing. Yeah, he was telling about that. Right. Right, but he's the only one so far that's, that's worn a uniform. Normally, we don't do that. So anything that you're comfortable in, you know, so like what you're wearing now is just fine. That's, uh, uh, or whatever you want to do, that's fine. If I can uh, take these two pictures with me and scan yeah, them, and I'll give sure them back can. to you on Wednesday. You sure can. 
Uh, uh, let's see if there are any more. You got there. anything else? Uh, uh. I don't know. I don't know what I have. Something I have over here. Uh, nothing, nothing more than that. From your, uh, here's, uh, here's a picture I took a few years ago mm -hmm. when I was 60 years old. That's my son, daughter-in-law, mm -hmm. Ann and I. Oh, good. Yeah. You mind if I borrow this and do it so we'll just oh, have the sure. family? Yeah. That'll be good. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's yeah. a good picture. We're all 10, 15 <laughs> years younger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll take that. Wait, I'll, oh, look I'll, at that. Look at the pistol yeah, collection um, that you have. See, there. I have this collection of uh This is an Air Force shooting metal that he got. Uh-huh. It's called a leg oh, metal. Uh, I, I was able to wear, allowed me to wear that on my uh, uniform. Right. And... Uh, uh, a number of 45s and so forth. This was belonged to my grandfather um, in the on the ranch down in Quero, mm -hmm. and I kind of taught myself how to shoot with that when I was about 12, 13 years old I during see. the war. Wow! And on Walton Drive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When there wasn't anything else. Well, there wasn't anything back of us, and the the um, post oak trees in the backyard have a lot of 45 scars on. Wow, that is quite a collection. My goodness gracious. We've got uh, picked up stuff from, from yeah. all over. Yeah. Uh, you might uh, be interested. Okay. A couple of things back here. Um, 